two, one. And you're live. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So today's panel is being hosted by the Women of Aeronautics and Astronautics and is named Let's Lose Count of Minority Talents in Aerospace. My name is Shireen and I'll be a moderator today and I'm joined by four incredible panelists whom I will introduce in a little bit. In 2020, WOA initiated a series of virtual events focusing on not only promoting diversity, but also on cultivating belonging and inclusion within the airspace industry. This event will act as the third part of our series, following on from the microaggressions and allyship panels that you can find on our YouTube channel. The focus for this conversation is navigating and championing the retention of underrepresented and minority candidates. Hiring diverse talent is a crucial topic, but is only the first step to inherently improving any industry's DI landscape. We will hear from our panelists about what has helped them remain in aerospace and how various tools, resources, and initiatives can be used to bring in other candidates and create inclusive spaces at all career levels. The hashtag Let's Lose Count that we've been using to advertise this event comes from an Instagram post by entrepreneur and model Tyra Banks, where she emphasizes the importance of losing count of those who follow the first to break through into any space. This message rings true to WOA's mission of empowering minorities to succeed in aerospace. I will first give a brief introduction of our panelists and then get started on the main panel. So Ms. Tiffany Lockett is a co-founder of the Patty Gray Smith Fellowship and currently serves as the Mars Ascent Vehicle Assembly Integration and Test Lead at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. She has served on the selection committee for the NASA Academy Internship Program the Gerald F. Sutton Memorial Grant Program and the Brooke Owens Fellowship Program. Dr. Renee Horton is an inspirational speaker, author, and DEI advocate who believes in changing the face of STEM through community efforts. She was the first African American to receive a PhD in material science with a focus in physics from the University of Alabama. She's the founder of Unap Unapologetically Being Incorporated, a nonprofit for STEM mentoring and advocacy, and is also an executive mentor for the Pell Grade Smith Fellowship. In her day job, she serves as a NASA Space Launch System Quality Engineer. Dr. Victoria Neji specializes in robotics transportation and human systems engineering applications across various industries, including aerospace. She was the first person to earn a PhD from Duke University's robotics program. She currently splits her time as a strategist and engineer at Edge Case Research and Aurora Innovation. This is alongside being an executive mentor for the Patty Gray Smith Fellowship and also a co-founder of the Monica Chibuogu Neji Foundation a public charity investing in health equity, educational advancement, and community empowerment. And finally, Ms. Landani Johnson is the sitting chief engineer of the Airspace Special Interest Group of the National Society of Black Engineers and specializes in defense and commercial airspace system safety and reliability engineering. She serves as the aircraft segment system safety team lead at WISC Aero and has worked with teams at Northrop Grumman, United Airlines, and NASA. So to start, to start our panel today, our first question to all the panelists is, throughout your career so far, have you noticed a significant difference in the diversity of your organizations between the early, mid, and senior career levels? And how has this made you feel? Dr. Nathan, do you want to get started and we can go down the line? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say for me early on um, in my career, and I began fairly early, um, around the age of 12. Um, it's a long story, but I, I began working as a computational scientist. And at that point, I don't think I really noticed um, the differences between me and other people like my peers. I think uh, the, the big difference for me, um, and there's always a lot of times has been just my age, being younger than most people, and then also uh, being taller than most people. Um, but as I've progressed in my career, um, I've definitely um, it's definitely set out more that it's almost always like the first thing that I notice about any organization that I step into is just that uh, there's a lack of cultural diversity. Um, but I try not to allow that to um, to make me feel like I don't belong. Um, it's, it's really challenging because there's so many fears associated with that. But I think I just um, what I do with that fear is I try to push against it and um, still uh, connect with people, even if we may not seem to identify on certain things initially. Um, and I just try to use every moment that I'm interacting with people to continue to grow myself and also think about growing the organization. So it's definitely changed over the course of my career and it, it's, I, I still experience it today, um, but I think there are things that we can do to protect ourselves and also to, to show our value at work. Uh, 
Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that. Um, so when I, I first started at NASA about 15 years ago as an intern, and even then I was still the only black um, student in the, the immediate kind of group, uh, internship group that I was in. And even then I was one of few women, but um, supervisor wise, there was quite a few women that were in um, leadership, like team lead or immediate supervisor positions. So you could start to see, if you look at it from a generational point of view, uh, the longer that you have been been at NASA, um, the the makeup of of that generation will be a little bit more homogeneous than the next, and then it's gotten it's gotten progressively better, but not as good as it could be. And so, being a, a child of the '80s, I feel like I shouldn't be the I shouldn't still be the only black woman in a room, um, especially since I've been been around for for almost a decade now, for or over a decade now. So that's where I'm, I'm seeing where, um, and I'm looking forward to some of the other questions about retention, where we really need to make sure that we're bringing people in, making sure that they feel included, so they wanna stay for the, the breadth of their career. Um, because you're not gonna see leaders if you, know, you, you do a good job getting them in the door up front, and then by the time they get to the leadership positions, they've all left. So, um, it, the one good thing that I have seen is that there is a lot more women um, that are advancing into major program management roles and even center director roles um, around the agency, but there's still um, work to go. Um, I don't have too much to add, but I wanted to echo what Ms. Lockett said. Um, it seems like uh, the percentage of underrepresented communities uh, folks diminishes um, as you get to the senior levels. And so, yeah, I, I agree that it's just a small percentage of us at each level in general. Dr. Hart, I was yeah, waiting sorry. for me to say something. Um, uh, but my view of it is, uh, is somewhat similar to Tiffany's because we're at the same um, place. It's just that for me, it's a lot more frustrating um, I do a lot of public outreach and I feel like I'm a liar um, on most days when people ask me what it is to work for NASA. You know, NASA is the, the brand of the people um, when it comes to aerospace, but to, to, to want to promote little black girls and little black boys to go there um, kind of frustrates me quite a bit because I know that they're not going to truly be valued for who they are or what they bring to the table because NASA doesn't do a good job of that. Um, I'm in a, scene, uh, in a leadership development program across the agency and I'm the only black. And I, don't under, I do not understand that. I just don't understand it enough anymore that you're telling me that we're either not good enough or you're just not recruiting hard enough or you're not making it attractive enough for us to want to be in your leadership roles. And that's a problem. It's a problem across the agency. Um, and I thought maybe it was our center and then are the centers in the South and it's not, you know, um, all of my interaction thus far, even with my, this program that's across the agency, outside of the people who interviewed me have still been white, white male or white female. And so I, that to me is a, um, it's a problem. It's a struggle um, because it's almost one of those things like in academia when they, they're, they're looking and they say, well, we just can't find, you know, we just didn't get the applicants, right? And so my question always is, why aren't you trying harder, right? You, you're not making people feel included for them to just step up and raise their hands. Um, the day I walked into the program and I found out I was the only black, I wanted to walk away again. I was like, because this becomes one of those, you know, oh, she, you know, she was the first or she did this. And I'm sick of that title of being the first or having to keep breaking um, these glass ceilings, so. Thank you for all of your responses. Uh, I definitely relate to that as a young engineer. Um, it's difficult to find senior level uh, role models, but I'm very grateful for all of you. Uh, so a connected question uh, would be, what strategies and techniques have all of you found most helpful in introducing and promoting DI at various levels? So we have a diversity of organizations. Um, Lindani, you've worked for uh, WISC, Aero, and also some larger organizations. And as Ms. Lockett and Dr. Horton mentioned, NASA, so anything that has stood out to you as helpful in introducing and promoting DEI at all levels? Uh, uh, so I can kind of begin with um, some experience in terms of recruitment and um, 
and retainment that I've seen in the industry. Um, so I've worked at two companies named Aurora, one, um, the Boeing Flight Sciences Corporation, but currently I'm um, an advisor with um, Aurora Innovation, which develops uh, autonomous vehicle technologies. And one initiative that I found to be really creative and also just um, insightful of them is they have something called Returnship, which is geared toward women or others who may have needed to take a break in their career for caring for family or for whatever personal reasons. Um, and they give them an opportunity to actually begin to um, get employment kind of as an intern, but focusing on their needs and their specific circumstances um, and allowing them to have experience. And I think um, just them creating that program and sustaining the program, I think it just really revealed um, how they value talents regardless of uh, the different journeys that people have taken. So that's one initiative that I've seen that I hope more companies take on, especially um, during this pandemic as many people have had to reduce their time at work or completely um, drop out of the workforce. I think we really need to be thoughtful, just like how we're thoughtful with creating engineering solutions. We need to be thoughtful with creating human solutions. So um, that's what, what I wanted to share. And I hope more people take on um, that sort of initiative. Um, so one of the things uh, for me is why I pour into it is because, because NASA is the people's brand, right? Um, kids everywhere want want to, that's where they want to be at and that's what they want to end up doing. The little black girl who just won the spelling bee wants to work for NASA. And people say, you should go reach out to her because she's probably 30 minutes from me. And I said, I'm not the person right now to reach out to her because I don't think, I think she should take her talent somewhere else where they're going to be valued and where she's going to be valued and where somebody's not going to try to stop her soaring, right? Or her rise to whatever it is, her greatness is going to be. Um, if it had not been for the fact that the group that I have been placed with um, out in California is such a open, inclusive group. I'm the only black in the group, but that's okay. Because they opened, they opened the door and was like, here, here's your chair at the table. We want to hear your ideas. We want you to critique us. We want to know, you know what, what you're bringing to us. We saw your credentials on paper and we feel that you are a valued member of this team from day one. And so if I had not had that experience, it, it, I was ready to walk away from NASA um, and start, I had already started shopping and looking for another job because I was tired of, uh, of that. And it's a, it's a reminder, this particular team is a reminder because they've built their team very different. Their team was based on core values, like their project managers actually laid out core values with the chief engineers on like, how do we wanna treat our people? How do we wanna include our people? How do we wanna make sure everybody's good so that what they're bringing to the table is powerful and impactful and it's their talent and it's their 100% and they're not being beat down by everything else. So if I had not seen that it is truly possible to do it a different way, my talents would have been somewhere else. And that's what Tiffany was talking about. How do we do retention? How do we maintain retention, right? And doing that is people have to feel valued. And so I do pour my existence into DNI, DENI, simply because I want to make sure that when the next person decides that they want to sit at this table, that they're included and they, they're valued as well. So um, I wanted to jump in and say that I haven't um, seen any um, overt uh, retention programs at any of the companies that I've worked at. Um, so I was like, I was surprised to see the question actually. Um, the only retention like things that I've seen are sort of like sparse employee research groups, but I don't think that's enough. Um, I think another uh, Thing that companies try to do is diversity training and like um, sensitivity training and things. And I think it's upgraded in uh, places like Mountain View, but I think that it's it's lacking um, in uh, other places like the defense industry and um, just overall aerospace that's not as progressive. Asakit, do you have anything to add? Oh, sorry, thank you. Yeah, I've been, I've been taking, taking notes because you guys are saying some great things. But I think one thing um, to, to, to tag on here is really the, the importance of allyship and mentorship. And it is harder to find mentors that look like you, that have the same experience as you if, you know, you look higher up in the organization um, and you just don't see it. So 
you know, one technique that I've had to do is diversify, have multiple mentors and one, one mentor that, that does this, that, and the other. And, and between the three of them, I eventually can see, you know, what, what my future could be. Um, And it's mostly just because of the resources that I have, but, you know, just talking about, um, there's been some conversations at, at the agency and there, of course, there was a lot of conversation because of Black Lives Matter last year, but there hasn't been much momentum beyond let's have the conversation is kind of petered off. And it's really because I think that in a lot of cases, um, when people think of diversity and equity and inclusion, they look to their minority employees to carry that torch. And we really need allyship from the majority to lead that conversation and to lead the change and to be what it is that they um, what it is that they want to see. So, um, so yeah, I just wanted to add that 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 note. Absolutely, thank you so much. So, Dr. Horton, we'd love to ask you specifically about um, how your outreach efforts also come in the form of international speaking engagements and being an author of multiple books. Um, so, when a member of an underrepresented demographic listens to or reads your work, what do you hope that they're taking away from it? And you know, what do you hope that they remember maybe 10 years in the future when they're in their career? I'm hoping that they can remember that uh, regardless of how rough it gets, you, you deserve to be there. Um, you know, I, I talk about changing the face of STEM simply so that, you know, this little girl who just won the spelling bee and when she walks into NAS, I wanted it to be such that she's found her, her home, right? You've, you've found that place because when you find the place that you are valued in and you're included in and you're happy in, man, there's no telling what can be unlocked and unleashed when you're not having to deal with the rest of the stuff that, that, you know, that society dishes us for with dealing with racism and all of that. So I pour my efforts into the outreach and into the books to make sure that there's something standing once I'm no longer standing or I can't continue carrying, you know, the fight or keep going, right. That somebody else will be willing to pick up the torch and say, you know what, she did all of these things. Let's not let that die. Let's, let's keep the fight going and um, keep, keep moving. But it's always the, the moments like um, the sweet little boy who wore a cochlear implant, right. And I wear my hearing aids and I went in and we were reading out loud and he says, oh, I want to read out loud because she could read out loud too. And then he went to read out loud and he has the deaf accent. So he doesn't speak as clearly. Right. And the other kids went to tease him and I went, no, don't do that. Would you tease me? And they would, we'd never tease you, but you're not going to tease him. And so he finished reading with us that day. And his teacher wrote me um, a year later to tell me how much more confident he was and how much more he participated in simply because he remembers Dr. H um could read too with her hearing aids and so doing the outreach isn't really for me it's really about the kids and the other people that i get to touch whether they look like me or don't look like me and being able to make that type of impact and plant those kind of seeds so that these kids can really determine and even our our youth um our college students so that they can understand that regardless you know how rough it could be it's still worth it at the end Absolutely. But thank you so much. That's so inspirational to hear. Um, and speaking of carrying on the fight, uh, Dr. Naji, uh, it's very impressive, obviously, that you were the first person to uh, obtain a PhD from Duke University's robotics program. So um, what were some of the challenge you, challenges you faced in that process? And also, um, were you or your colleagues able to pave the pathway for others in this particular program who come after you? Okay. Um, thanks for your question, Shireen. And, um, and yes, uh, there were... <laughs> Uh, many challenges, particularly in the beginning of my journey in the PhD um, program, um, because I did do a, a master's degree before starting the PhD, and the master's is engineering management, so it was a lot more, um, it was pretty sociable, so I, and I met a lot of students who came from other countries and had different cultures, um, so I was kind of going into the PhD with that same mindset from the earlier graduate program, uh, but I, I think I should have probably <laughs> talk to more people about the PhD path because I realized it was pretty lonely, um, especially in my first semester, um, because I'm very, I'm a very collaborative person, but um, just the way that the research was designed, like, I, you know, I was in, in charge of one line of research and each other person in my lab was, had their own line as well. And, and uh, all, everyone else in my lab, <laughs> they were all white men when I first started. Um, so I would say when I began, it was clear, you know, the difference. Um, and it wasn't just their race, or um, their gender, it was just also culturally different in terms of just, I think how 
we saw the world and how they approached working together because we took a lot of courses together and I just felt really lonely and I felt like um, even when we would have team meetings I felt like when I would share a thought or ask a question like it wasn't heard at all um, and I just remember um, my lab we had a, a Christmas party um, at my professor's house um, that first uh, December of the PhD track and and um, and I, I remember like being at home and crying with my mom saying like I didn't, I didn't want to go to that party because I just felt like I just couldn't be myself or be be seen and heard as, as I am. Um, and I'm just thankful that I discovered like a key treasure that I had was just my family. Um, Cause I'm, I was fortunate like going to Duke, a lot of people actually are not from the city that Duke is based in Durham, North Carolina, but I, I grew up in Durham and I'm thankful that I could earn all those graduate degrees at home. Um, and so I'm, I realized then in that moment when, when my mom empowered me like saying like, like, no, don't, don't, um, cut yourself out of like being in this environment just because of how other people behave like you belong there and um and we're gonna and she 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 like committed to being a part of my journey to help me to you know persist and continue and so I just really tapped into my family throughout my my journey I think that's what really helped me was just staying grounded even as I re re um, was reaching for the stars and that um and so from that point on, like I invited my mom and my sisters come to the party with me and every live event that, that we had open, I would just bring my family with me. Any like special dinners or even when I was traveling to conferences, like when I went to AIAA in Florida at Disney World, they came with me and it just made me feel like, like I was attached to reality of like my value and who I was. Um, and also it's something, different things happened along the way that, that the initial team of other people in the lab that were there when I first started although they were a couple of years ahead of me, they ended up leaving the lab for different reasons. I didn't really look to see why. I, I was just thankful, thankful each time because I felt like I could breathe a bit more in the lab. And so by the time I was like, like halfway through my experience, I became the most senior person in the lab. And I made, made sure that each time, um, first I made sure that we actually would recruit people who are diverse. So I just, even people who weren't even thinking about our lab, um, if they happen to maybe, if they're, if they were switching programs for some reason, maybe the original lab didn't work out, I would just have coffee with them, learn about them and ask what their goals were. And then I would basically be like an introductor, introducer to the professor to say, hey, I think this person would be great. And, you know, and then when they when they joined the lab, then I would just help them out. Not, not even really technical. A lot of things are just more like social things. Um, so I think by the time that I graduated, I'm thankful that I feel like the lab atmosphere really transformed so that anyone who was coming, even if they were just visiting for the summer or if they were there long-term, that they felt like they could be themselves and they could take leadership in different ways. Um, so I think I really saw a transformation. I'm thankful that I stuck through um, because I think my presence alone, it really inspired other people to know that it's possible, um, even if it's hard. Uh, and so other things became hard, you know, the actual research was also pretty hard as well, but I just learned to, to talk more with people and to to re realize the treasures that I had with my family. And it's made a big difference for me. Thank you for your answer, Dr. Naiti. So the next question, um, I actually originally wrote for Lindani, but now that I'm reading it back, I realized that um, obviously Ms. Lockett, uh, Dr. Naiti and Dr. Horjan, you're also mentors for um, the Patty Graceman Fellowship Program. But Lindani, if you wanna start out, the question is, uh, with being involved in groups like NESTI, uh, what are some of the biggest challenges that you've seen that get in the way of retaining minority engineers that are fresh out of university? So kind of focusing on um, early career, uh, what are the challenges you've seen in you know, keeping uh, young female uh, and uh, underrepresented engineers on that path? So um, I think that a major one is a lack of support system. Um, and that support system could be um, either a family support system, friends, or even a work support system. So um, some ways to make that better or to have um, employee research uh, resource groups. Um, and then also I know some companies do um, some sort of a cohort thing. So when early career folks come in, like, you know, like say it's summer 2021, like you guys, um, they sort of form a team and do uh, like outings and um, kind of form a little family. Um, and then uh, I think um, uh, other challenges um, early career folks face is after they graduate, they're not sure like what to do, do with it. Um, so uh, I encourage people, you know, so um, Ms. Lockett already kind of um, touched on this before, but to find a mentor. Um, 
So go find a mentor and then also mentor somebody else and, and pay it forward. But Nesby uh, forms some uh, so forms partnerships with universities and also um, it forms new ones. And that's to help connect students to mentors um, and then uh, help those students network in order to find a job and just sort of like building a pipeline um, from universities to welcoming organizations. If the other panelists have anything to add from their experiences at the Patty Grace Fellowship, please go ahead. Um, mine isn't just particularly from the Patty Grace Fellowship. Um, it's more along, because I did a fellowship. I did the uh, Harriet G. Jenkins Fellowship um, coming through uh, graduate school. And I also did a, um, a NASA, it was a graduate student research fellowship, right? And they brought us in in cohorts. So we were always a group of people. And so um, uh, the Patty Grace Fellowship is based off of that same type principle, where it's a cohort of people that are uh, coming in together. And so with us, with the, um, with the NASA fellowships, you, you had the cohort before you um, that pinned you, and then you pinned the cohort behind you. And so there, you were always at the conference with, you were the new one, the incoming, and then there was the ones being pinned and then the outgoing, right? And so there was always 60 of us together and it gave you the opportunity to build across the arrow, uh, across that field, um, 60 people, right? A chance to meet that many people. So when you're bringing that many cohorts in, and I, I really wish NASA would hire in cohorts um, as well when they when they bring us in, just simply so that, you know, we're, we're building that kind of, um, unity together that you have you have that and you can kind of reach back and so i do love the um the idea of cohort building and the way patty grace has done it um i've reached out to my mentee but i've had other mentees reach out to me just simply because my name is listed and they want to talk about you know where they are or what they're doing and so the fellowship allows that type of building um to actually happen and i think it's a really good thing I think the, the number one thing just to um, hop on what uh, Dr. Horton was saying is just exposure. A lot of these students just don't know what is out there, what direction their career could go, what companies are available. And so at the Patty Gray Smith Fellowship, we tend to uh, focus in on freshmen and sophomores to, to get them that exposure, to get them educated on what is um, possible and what is out there but also building that network that um, Mandani was talking about. Once you kind of start building a network of like-minded folks that, that understand the struggles that you've been through that are empathetic and sympathetic to which challenges that you're having, and, um, and then also exposure to mentors that have seen it and that have done it and, hey, can give you some good tips and advice on how to go forward. That's really what the, the good benefit of having that network there and just getting them exposed to it does so much. Um, even if they decide to go you know, left, they're like, oh, aerospace is not for me. But now they know, hey, there's all these other ways that I can get involved in what it is that I'm interested in. And that's really helps build that foundation for wanting them to, to stay. Um, even if it's not with one particular um, company or agency, but within the industry itself. Thank you so much. So I would love to ask all of you that um, obviously you contribute a lot of your time and energy to various fellowships and community initiatives for DI and STEM and also specifically aerospace. For anyone who wants to follow in your footsteps, what should they focus on to be able to make positive change as an individual um, in this movement that can often seem overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly large. Would anyone like to get started? Um, yeah, I can start. Uh, I think in terms of um, getting involved in this movement, I think focusing on, I think first trying to understand who, who you see yourself as, um, or who you, you see yourself developing into um, and really um, kind of spending time to really do self-reflection as well as just thinking about the core of what drives you and what you've noticed has driven you throughout your journey, not just in the workplace or in school, but just even in life as you, as you think about how you've navigated your community. Um, so I think uh, sometimes if we only 
look externally to see oh what's everyone else doing then we might miss out on like what our what what we're created to do and who we're created to be in this world i think we all have a purpose um so i really just recommend kind of first starting with yourself and of course it's not only um a selfish thing of like only about me and what i think about me but also maybe talking to people who are your, in your trusted circles like what have you noticed about me and what do you think i can i can do to add value to this movement um and if you feel like there are things that you don't know then also try to take time to learn those things as well um whether it's through reading or talking to people who have experience um and and then i think hopefully once you've done that process then it'll help you kind of with navigating because it's it's not easy and there's a lot of um it's it can be draining sometimes and it can feel like maybe you're not making much movement although you're using a lot of effort um but but i think if you kind of if you feel a lot more stronger in terms of the core of who you are then i think you, you can face any challenges along the way and still hopefully make an impact and um help others along the way so so that's my i guess advice on 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 how to get involved yeah just just with anything that's a large kind of um very big picture, big world issue that that uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is. It's um, really finding what is it that you want to do. What is it that you can change? What's that small nugget that you can focus your in, your energy on? If you feel like you can't tackle everything, there's probably one thing that you can do. Is it the outreach? Is it educating people? Is it um, staying in the industry. I mean, those are are, are things that you can do. Um, and so with uh, the Patty Gray Smith Fellowship, it was more of just the desire of, I was tired of people saying, oh, well, I keep going to these same five schools and I can't find all these black applicants. Where are they? I was like, well, I got 43 of them for you guys. Um, and we're going to have more next year, next year, next year. And so it's, um, it's, hey, let's find that small thing that you're like, you know, if it's just a matter of exposing or making people more aware, or if it's just me going out and doing activities with middle schoolers, I mean, that, that helps, um, that little bit helps because it's the collective approach that's really gonna make the change. Um, I think we also need to kind of install in, in like instill this in idea of paying it forward um, and being a part of this community um, because you know it's like I can name like a couple of people who helped me get to where I am and it would you know I know that it would have been you know nice to have that earlier so if I um, if we say hey initially like let's all pay it forward the folks that you mentor will try to mentor other people and we'll just keep you know strengthen this community and network. Um, I, I want uh, to point out when uh, Dr. Victoria was speaking, she was saying she had her family and her family was her network, right? And so being a part of this, um, I'm hoping to be a part of someone's network um, to be able to give them um, that support, whether it's showing up, I'll take a trip to Disney World anytime, Dr. Victoria too. But if it's showing up just to be able to be a cheerleader, um, to let them know um, that there's somebody in their corner, right? Um, so the personal mentoring that I actually do, it's, it's about having somebody in your corner who truly is there not to pass judgment, but to truly understand that this is your experience. This is what you're walking in. These are your shoes. I'm not bending over to tie your shoes for you. You are, but I'm there if you need help getting back up because you bent over to tie your shoes, right? To be able to walk your walk. And so being a part of this fight is, is that for me. Um, and being a part of someone's network, uh, whether it's with the Patty Grace, I sit on the executive board for the LSU mentoring um, and then having my own mentoring organization. And all of those things are extremely important to me because somebody did it for me. Um, there were people who looked like me and people who didn't look like me, who mentored me along the way and who helped open doors for me um, and helped me understood um, when I got my seat at the table, how important it was to say, hey, so-and-so is shadowing me, so I need a seat at the table for them too, um, to allow other people to be in that space as well. Um, I don't think this is going to change without that happening. So um, like uh, uh, Lindana was saying, I think I may have said your name wrong, so I do apologize. But um, like she was saying, it's very, very important to pay it forward. Um, and I don't think we're going to get anywhere, right, if we're not reaching back to pull 
somebody else with us forward, right? And then they do the same so that at some point when we're all standing on the platform, it's not just one on the platform. Thank you so much for all your answers. And uh, that was a very uh, good ending, Dr. Horton, especially with the hashtag Let's Lose Count. Um, we use that for this event because we thought that was important in uh, under the thread of paying it forward. So continuing on that thread, uh, we've spoken a little bit about how you all have held leadership opportunities at work, but also in your DI efforts. Um, however, we also know that underrepresented minorities are more likely to turn down an opportunity for leadership positions than the majority demographic. And there can be external factors to this that uh, can lead to them to feel less confident in their abilities, but there's also internal factors like imposter syndrome. So how do you think we can encourage more women and other underrepresented, underrepresented genders to take on these leadership roles um, or to put themselves forward for them? Um, so first I wanna say that I don't think we should give uh, leadership roles for the, for, to women just for the sake of giving them to women. I think leadership roles could, should go to the person who best fits the job. Um, whether they're man, woman, brown, white, striped, or polka dotted. Um, but uh, I think that we need to help build confidence through mentoring. Like we've, we've been just talking about mentoring, like this, our, building our community is so, so, so important. And so, um, you know, your mentor is inherently a leader. Um, and so uh, you'll build, and then when you pay it forward, you'll build leadership skills as you mentor someone else. Um, and so uh, we need to make sure everybody you know, every, like women are um, uh, open to constructive uh, criticism. And so when you talk to your mentor, you should say, you know, um, what leadership traits, you know, are, am I weakest at? Um, which ones do I need uh, strengthened? So I think we just need to be able to, you know, speak to each other and, and um, be able to, uh, you know, uh, give each other constructive criticism. Yes, and just to add on to um, Ms. Johnson, what you just said about um, leadership, traits, I think also it, it's good to kind of rethink what we have seen in his story as leadership traits, because, you know, in history, people who have, who have held positions of leadership have historically been men um, in terms of formal leadership. I think women have always held leadership in ways that haven't been recognized. And so I think it's important to rethink uh, what are the traits of leaders and really think about what are the goals of the organization? What are we really trying to accomplish in terms of our talents and recruiting, retaining, and really um, growing our talents. And a lot of traits that um, people have that may not um, be textbook leadership can actually be valuable to an organization. So, so I think um, one thing is just um, thinking critically and creatively about leadership traits and um, not um, not trying to force everyone to fit into, <laughs> into uh, a, a square um, uh, hole if they have a different shape, I think. Um, kind of seeing how they perform in different environments and gathering data along the way, actually tracking information and using that information to inform decisions that are make, made for leaders. I think that those are all ways that we can encourage more women. And, and also, I think even the way that roles are designed, making it so that um, it, it considers, considers a lot of the external factors that women have to deal with, like just historically and throughout our society, women also end up taking a lot of more care roles within their family. So I think considering the time requirements for that and even the, the, the location requirements for that and how do you adjust it and still accommodate um, people who have different needs, um, so whether that's their gender or if they have a disability or anything, just trying to, trying to be more accommodating for people who have differences. And then you'll really see um, new kinds of leaders, I think, in the next generation. I can honestly say not everybody's meant to be a leader. <laughs> so um, I definitely agree with Ms. Johnson by saying when she said not everybody should just be put into a leadership role um, simply because it's a woman. But I do think um, when they are looking at it, um, just like Dr. Victoria was saying, that there are different leaders. And so being a part of this leadership development program has really been good for me because it has really opened my eyes um, just across not only just our agency, but uh, across other industries as well when I'm, when I'm now interacting with other leaders, right? And looking at the characteristics and being able to understand which ones are good leaders and which ones aren't. Um, good leaders. And so if nothing else, um, even if I don't get promoted into a leadership role um, with NASA, I know once I walk away from NASA, I'm going to be a good leader somewhere else, just simply because of the training that I got. Um, 
some le some leaders are natural born leaders and it comes very natural to them in, in who they are and it's at their core, right? It's, it's who they are naturally. And other people can develop into great leaders. The problem is we have a lot of leaders who have had no development um, at all. And that kind of hinders uh, retention, um, whether or not other people want to be there, how successful their teams are and things like that. And they're not willing to take the critique that goes along with that that goes along with that to say, this is how I could be a better leader. So I think with some leadership development, um, you could definitely have some better leaders and that would affect so many other areas. The pocket, did you have anything to add? All those answers were great. So I'm just, I'm gonna <laughs> concur, concur, concur. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so speaking of uh, kind of uh, mentoring and, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Right, sorry. So my next question would be uh, for someone who is breaking through at least after uh, all of, after someone who has been the first in the space and specifically in terms of imposter syndrome, I think we spoke a little bit about it when Dr. Neji was going through experience, but do you have any advice uh, for someone who might be uh, looking to be the first, whether to get a degree or whether the first uh, person who looks like themselves in a team, in a company, is there any kind of concrete advice that you have um, in terms of self-reflection or anything like that to get them through those struggles? Yeah, I think um, Dr. Horton's plan that's out. I think it's a big piece along with kind of what I said earlier about getting to know yourself and <laughs> taking dates with yourself, getting to like really um, get to the core of who you are and kind of where you think your purpose is. I think also having a network, a community of people. So even if they are not um, enrolled in the program with you or if they are in a different um, department, that's kind of also what I did along the journey, along with my family. I also kind of made a network of other people who I met in different ways, um, whether it was through social activities or otherwise, and they might have been like in the chemical or chemistry department, or they might have been in in history or something, but 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 the, we valued each other. And so when I was preparing for my dissertation, I would invite them all to be on my like mock committee to give me feedback and also to encourage me on the journey. Um, so I just think taking those steps and and no one there wasn't like that special um, program that assigned me these mentors or assigned me these peers. I kind of had to navigate and figure it on my own. But then of course there were certain programs that I applied to that did also kind of came with with these peers so i think doing doing the work um yourself and then also realizing you don't have to go through it alone um and also i think i didn't even really think of myself as the first until like until i had the degree in my hand and i was like wow i, I became the first person to do this so i think also maybe not starting off with that mindset because it, it might kind of affect the way you approach things um i think um if you end up being that way, then then see see to it that um, that you're not not the only for, forever um, if if you can. Um, but also realize that it's also not on all on you, especially if you're if you're a student in a program. You know there are faculty who are paid to do the things that you desire to do um, in terms of increasing diversity. So I would encourage you also not to put all the pressure on yourself to change things that are wrong with the organization. Um, I I heard an interview of a, a person who recently turned down an offer to be. Um, tenure track at a university and she chose a, a better university to take her career with. And, and one of her statements was just um, to realize that, you know, it wasn't on her to fix the issues um, that there are administrators and others who, who have those responsibilities. So I think just remembering that, especially as a student to not take it all on yourself and to, to, um, to really uh, think about like the long, the long haul and how you, the work that you're doing today, how that can prepare you for the bigger impact that you can have in the future. So those are my thoughts. I was exhausted um, being the first. Um, I knew the second year in, um, and they were like, if you pass your qualifiers, you'll be the first African-American. I was like, oh, geez, okay. And when I failed my qualifier, everybody knew it too. So did the janitor. Janitor is one who told me I failed part of my qualifier because it was in the, you know, on the desk and they saw it. And so I came in, she was like, oh baby, I'm so sorry. And I was like, what? <laughs> she was like, you failed part of that quad, that thermo stuff, girl, you, you didn't do real good. She was like telling me how bad I did. I was like, dang, okay. Um, but 
every but but they were also there to celebrate me when I passed. They were throwing me like a little party. And when I came in, the janitor said, they won't let me have none of that cake. So when you come out there and you finish celebrating, can you bring me peace? And I said, I sure will. Yes, ma'am. What are we celebrating? She said, oh, you passed that thermal thing they was talking about. Um, And I was while I was cleaning up, I was listening and they had said you had passed. And I was like, oh, OK. So my surprise, you know, wasn't a surprise. But it also meant that everybody in the community where I was, because being at the University of Alabama and being the only black in my program and then being the first out of my program, it was exhausting. Um, people in my community knew <laughs> that I was. Um, I was in the sorority and they knew that I was. And so, you know, people were there during to celebrate me. But when I was failing, I, I was too embarrassed to be able to say the other people, right, that I, I had fallen on my face or I didn't do so well, not really understanding that failure is a part of my success as well. And so it, it's a big one when you make the choice um, to be the first. When you make the choice to be the first, not only do you need to understand what your armor is to be able to get you through it, you need to understand what village is going to be there to help you uh, when you're wounded to be able to get back up and to keep going. Um, I was in school, in graduate school with my three kids. And so I, I came home one day and wanted to quit. And my son said, well, are we a doctor yet? And I said, no, we are not a doctor and we are not going to be a doctor. He says, but are we a doctor yet? Because if we're not a doctor, I'm not sure why you quitting and then he said can't you just eat your ice cream today and then go back tomorrow you know and for him like they didn't have the concept like I was beaten down but it also meant that I really couldn't quit either because I had lied to these kids and told them we were going to be a doctor um <laughs> when I graduated and so you know I had to go back in it and so I think it's really important if you make the conscious effort to be the first like you are ready to go charging in there to make some changes on something that you are properly prepared um, for the beating that you're going to take. Because when you're asking people to talk about diversity, inclusion, and even equity, you're also asking them to examine the core of who they are, who their grandparents are, who their, you know, who their parents are, the fundamentals they've been raised on. Um, and so you're asking people to do that work um, for you, for little old you, right? I'm asking you to think about what your grandparents told you for little old me. Um, so you have to be prepared for that and having a network. And I've got multiple networks. I had the National Society of Black Physicists when I was in graduate school and we had an annual conference every year. And that conference made a difference for me because it was a place that I could walk into and everybody was black and everybody was smart and everybody, it was just a rainbow coalition happening in there. And you could, catch people over in the corner having string theory conversations and you'd be like yo like that's coming out that brother's mouth that brother is real deep right they gave me and poured back into me every single year and then when I had the the fellowships for NASA and I had those cohorts and those cohorts were black white and Latino and to be able to sit in a room with people who did not look like you and to hear that they were having the same exact problems as you meant okay I'm in a place where I'm, I'm gonna be okay after all because other people are having these problems too and but you could hear the way that they were solving all of these problems so if you're gonna walk out there in that that boat and talk about you're gonna be the first just be prepared and have some people in your corner like my son is going to say, eat your ice cream now and cry about it. But you're going to have to get back in this fight and you're going to have to keep going. That's my two cents. Ms. Lockett or Ms. Johnson, did you have anything to add to this question? I was, I was going to say that. I was going to talk about networking, but Dr. Horton covered it. It's really important to find even though if you are at a particular school or a particular company and you're the first there, there's probably someone else that was the first in that same type of role at another university or another company. And so it's going out and, and putting in the work to find that network and to connect. And even if it's cold calling or sending an email, it's nice to see someone else that looks like you or, or is in the same type of position as you and people will respond. Um, so, so don't be afraid to, to reach out and, and look for all the different networks that are out there that's available. Um, but Dr. Horton just said it really beautifully. Uh, Dr. Horton talked about um, uh, ex being exhausted. Um, that really resonated with me. Uh, people, sometimes when I vent about like what the weird racist 
sexist things that happen at work, they're like, why don't you say something? Um, but I feel like I have to pick my battles. Sometimes I say it'd be a part-time job if I like addressed everything that happened. So it's really understanding that these organizations are far from perfect and weird things are going to happen. Um, and you have to be prepared to um, you know, speak, speak about something, call somebody out or not, um, you know, depending on, on the day and how you're feeling. But um, I think it's important to just sit down and really take some time to understand why you are like, you know, in STEM, why you're doing this job, um, because your passion is really gonna be the thing that takes you. Absolutely, thank you so much. So I think we have a question that's coming from the YouTube live. So um, the person says, I love how everyone has pointed out the importance of community and networks. Um, how do you recommend finding and reaching out to people to build that support group um, in a workplace or any other um, organization? Whoever feels, uh, yeah. I know, I know for me, it, it really um, came down to when I was in school um, looking for the Black Engineering Black Engineer Lab, <laughs> where at the University of Maryland there is a a, a, a lab space for those that were in Tau Beta Pi, and then um, AIAA had a lab space, and then SHIP had a lab space. SWE had a room, and then the Black Engineers, and of course, all of our rooms are tiny compared to like AIAA and all the other ones. But um, go, just walking in, introducing yourself. Um, take, taking the risk, even if you don't know anybody there to, to get involved, attend the meetings. Um, uh, and, and even then try to attend the, the conferences. And a lot of times they have mixers and I was super introverted when I was in college. And so going to those things was like a, I had to get my mind right. Like, oh, I gotta go introduce myself to people that I don't know. But the more you do that, the more you get comfortable with, with that. And a lot of times you start seeing the same faces and start seeing the same names. The aerospace community in general is not that big uh, compared to all the other big engineering fields. So you'll start seeing the same names over and over again, the more you get involved with, with these clubs. So that's one way to build um, a good, good sense of community. Um, I teach my mentoring kids to, uh, four to the power of three. When you're at these conferences or in other places, you want to go four categories. You want to meet three people in each category. One are people who look like you. One are people who are doing the research that you're doing. Uh, one is research that you're interested in. And then three more people that don't look like you, <laughs> um, that you probably wouldn't if you saw them on the street, you just wouldn't walk up to them and be like, hey, can we be friends? Um, and so you wanna do that. Um, and if you do that and you can scale that number up or down based on the size of the conference, because if you had a conference with a thousand people, then you can shoot for five people in each one of those categories. But the catch is you wanna be able to, to build that sense of community and you want people in your community that aren't doing what you are doing. Um, so that, cause you're not really good at your science if you can't explain it to a three, a third grader, right? And so my mom and them didn't understand anything that I was doing, but they sure do understand that when you melt two pieces of metal and they join in the middle, it's a lot stronger than either side, like, you know, because that's how we were able to, to get them to understand what I was doing when it came to welding, to the type of welding that I was doing. So building um, those communities is really important. Um, and one of the students I was talking to was saying, well, I'm really shy. And I was like, my girlfriend, Jamie, she's a physicist as well. And she talks about asking those three questions, right? Um, that first question is, I, I absolutely love football. So I would walk up and say, hey, by any chance, do you like football, basketball, or baseball? And if they're baseball people and I'm not, I was like, gosh, how did you really sit through those nine innings like that? Like, tell me how to get through a game, you know, or something like that, you know, find something that you have. Um, we're all human. So there's gonna be something that you have in common with somebody else. You just gotta be willing to do that. that the three questions, um, once you figure out the people that you wanna to get to know um, and put in your community uh, and doing that. I think Dr. Horton, you answered uh, part of this question already, but a follow-up question we have from the chat is, uh, what are some ways in which you appreciate folks reaching out to you uh, you know, maybe younger engineers who are looking for mentoring or um, just someone to guide them through their way. I always have to tell them when they reach out, I am not the end all to be all. And if I don't know, if I can't help you out, I can almost certainly 
reach out to somebody that can. Um, a lot of times students reach out to me thinking, Dr. Horton is going to be the person, and I'm not always. Um, I don't know everybody's, I have not been in everybody's situation. I'm a very non-traditional student, so I've had a lot of other experiences. But usually if, if you call me and you reach out and if, if I can't do it, I'm quick to say, I know I'm not the person to help get you through this, but I know Tiffany and Tiffany knows 2,982 other people. And so Tiffany can help us get you somebody that does it. So just be mindful that even if you reach out to someone, be specific about what you want from that person, right? And then that way it makes it a lot easier for that person to even gauge if if they're going to be the person you need, because it's all of our, uh, our our wish that you if you want to be in this field that we want you in this field, but to help you get there right. Um, it may not be me, it could be somebody else, but I want to help you be in it if this is where you want to be. Yeah, use LinkedIn, send emails, follow up, be persistent when you're following up. Because a lot of times you meet you meet someone at a conference, you're like, oh, wow, that's a really good mentor. And they're insanely busy or they travel a lot or they're handling a lot of different email accounts. So be persistent and and stay on it and try to, try to follow up um, with them on a regular basis if you can. That's a good way. I just want to add really quick to what Tiffany said. If you meet somebody at a conference, you need to you need to reach back out to them within 72 hours. By the time I get on a plane and leave, that's over for me. And whatever my next thing is, I'm already working in that next space, you know, once once I leave there. Um, snap a picture of yourself and be like, hey, you met me in the hallway, or I was bothering you when you were grabbing your hot dog, and those things work. Um, give me a visual, give me a picture. Within 72 hours, you want to reach, be reaching out to whoever that person is. Um, this conference is going to end for me, and guess what? 72 hours, I'm already going to be, I'm already going to be gearing and working towards something else. I'm working two documentaries. I'm doing my outreach. I'm preparing for a workshop to teach for the very first time. I do a striving to thriving the other way. Yeah, from surviving to thriving workshop where I teach you guys techniques and give you tools to be able to keep moving um, when you're in these places of isolation and loneliness and those kind of things. And so I'm in the pre I'm preparing packets to be able to mail out for that. So within even within the next 72 hours. But if somebody from this conference was to send me an email and say, I heard you speak on the WOAA and I want to know X, Y and Z and you didn't get to see my face, but this is what I look like. Because I always like to know what to look like. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Uh, so we're conscious of time in the last couple of minutes. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in the chat or the YouTube. So uh, as a closing question, we'd love to ask, so uh, kind of a topical question. Do you think that the recent pandemic, um, current pandemic, has presented additional hurdles for organizations to navigate when it comes to retaining employees of underrepresented genders and backgrounds, and uh, how do you think this could be mitigated? Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, of course, yes, the answer is yes to your question is that um, like the pandemic has presented new challenges that, um, and I don't know if it's necessarily a new challenge, I think it's just really um, highlighted challenges that had existed beforehand. Um, but as I mentioned before, I think, um, especially for people who identify as women or who are, put, take the role of women within their families, they end up typically having the caregiver responsibility. And um, it's not necessarily that it's a burden, but it is time intensive. It's, it takes skill, it takes work and, and effort, um, but I don't think it's as valued as it should be in our society. Um, we rely on caregiving. And I think not until um, earlier this year when the White House uh, proposed the infrastructure plan that included caregiving um, for home and community-based care as the second line item for hundreds of billions of dollars that I really have language around this, but I do see it as infrastructure. It's, it's a way to enable access to mobility um, and mobility in the sense of being able to move around in your career, being able to not be feel like you're stuck in terms of what's possible for the impact that you can have. And so I, I, I do think companies can take a role in terms of recognizing that many people on their staff have these responsibilities and think again, thinking creatively about, okay, how can we accommodate the needs of the people on our staff? 
Um, how can we ensure that um, they still have a pathway for growth and that we still are able to get the value out of them while they, they, they don't feel like they're stressed at home? Because I think the stress, and I've studied this in my PhD, stress can affect performance um, for people like dispatchers or anyone in a different role. And so it really ends up biting into the bottom line if people don't pay attention. So I, I do think that there are ways that companies can um, actively create communities to connect caregivers to each other, um, to create incentives and benefits that um, take that in mind and really just include caregivers in the decision-making process. So that, that's one thing that I think can really help as we move forward from the pandemic. Did any of the other panelists have any um, thoughts on this question or any other closing thoughts for today? If not, I think we're good to close out. We're at 7 p.m. ET. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, joining us, all of the panelists and our attendees as well. And we hope to have you at more WOA events in the future. Tiffany. Thank you so much. Have a good weekend.